Do you see Algin on? Um, no, that was just the last thing. Yeah, he's on, but he's not on a panelist. Yeah, it's okay if he's not on panelists. Right, right, we're gonna okay, time to start, guys. Let's go. All let's right, go. let's we're... do it. I'm there ready. You go. I'm Gail Brewer, Manhattan Borough President, and I want to thank everyone for joining us to talk about the Summer Youth Employment Program. We have an amazing group of leaders who have been working in SYEP for a long time. We know that uh, there are budget challenges and we know that the mayor has indicated that the program may not continue uh, with its 75,000 young people. To his credit, that was a number that was the highest ever last summer. We don't necessarily know that it will be that high. We do know that we need funding and we do know that the leaders who are gonna be addressing us today have great ideas as do other nonprofits about how this program could be successful in a very challenging summer. But we all feel very strongly that SYEP should exist uh, despite all of the budget challenges. So to discuss all of this, I wanna start with JT Falcone, who's a policy analyst at the United Neighborhood Houses. He leads UNHs as what United Neighborhood Houses is known at in talking about neighborhood affordability, housing, economic development, and most importantly today, workforce development. And he's been doing this for five years, although you should know, JT, there are people on this call who've been doing this for decades. But anyway, please talk a little bit about what UNH has been doing to advocate for SYEP. Yes, of course. Uh, thank you, Borough President Brewer. Uh, really excited to participate. Uh, United Neighborhood Houses, uh, through the Neighborhood Family Services Roundtable and the Campaign for Summer Jobs, has been coordinating closely with SYEP providers who are settlement houses, uh, those are our members, our settlement houses, as well as who are um, other large uh, youth services and uh, human services providers across the city. Uh, so this has been going on for a few weeks now. The, the rumors started to sneak out that SYEP uh, might be uh, completely eliminated. And when the announcement first came out that SYEP would be eliminated, uh, providers were given 24 hours to ramp down their programs, which was, um, was the, the cut itself was, was unacceptable and the amount of time given uh, was unacceptable. So uh, UNH uh, assembled a sign-on letter uh, that we, we sent to uh, the speaker and to the, the mayor to just sort of note that the 24-hour the ramp down was unacceptable, that we wanted to work together um, with the, the mayor and speaker and, and uh, DYCD and other folks to uh, come up with alternatives for the summer and since then we've been working really closely with all of these providers to gather and compile the thoughts and ideas that they've been sharing and I don't want to take anybody else's airtime to talk about their ideas but we're hearing really really innovative solutions from providers on the ground about ways that programming could be run safely remotely ramped up quickly uh, if if need be if uh, social distancing measures are lifted midsummer um, and now, in, in addition, with, with the budget announcement last week, the summer programming generally with Compass, Beacon, Sonic, Cornerstone, all, uh, all being eliminated for the summer as well, we're, we're banding all of this work together with the Campaign for Summer Jobs, as well as the co uh, Campaign for Children and the Neighborhood Family Services Roundtable as the, the hashtag Save Our Summer NYC campaign to, to just say that we need to be having an open dialogue with the youth development experts, the youth themselves, about what safe programming could be run this summer because no programming is not an acceptable solution. It's, it's gonna lead to all kinds of fallout that I'll let the other experts with many more years than me of experience on the line talk about. So our next speaker is Dominique R. Jones and she has been the executive director of the Boys and Girls Club of Harlem since 2015. And she's one of these amazing leaders that JT talked about. Under her leadership, this wonderful organization has grown to serve over a thousand young people across six clubhouses in schools. And of course, it's very famous uh, historic PS 186, which is their clubhouse in which I went to the opening of, and it's extraordinary. She provides comprehensive youth development and it promotes academic success, good health, wellness, and all the great things that young people deserve. She does. She has been uh, in the past a program officer for the food bank uh, for New York City, president of the United Way of Central Ohio, and assistant commissioner for ACS, Administration for Children's Services. 
she went to the New School uh, Milano uh, graduate program and Spelman College. And I just want to say as somebody who has seen her in action, she's the kind of youth leader that we're very, very fortunate that she's in Harlem and in Manhattan and does a great job. Dominique, thank you. Go ahead. Dominique, are you there? Hi, sorry about that. Um, thank you again, Borough President Brewer. I want to just also thank you for your leadership and you really taking a step to make sure that this um, this issue is heard and that we can galvanize the whole whole New York City to be able to restore what is necessary to keep young people engaged. Um, Boys and Girls Club of Harlem, you know, we've been serving the Harlem community for well over 40 years and we're part of the SYP ecosystem. So, you know, we We've not done direct SYP work over these years, but we've received SYP young people and we currently subcontract with other boys and girls clubs who run summer youth employment programs to facilitate project based learning. We know already that, um, to be quite honest with you, SYP was totally underfunded anyway, um, even though we're serving more kids. It takes a lot more capacity for organizations to be able to execute these programs and and we built continuity. I know our partners Children's Aid Society, our partners Madison Boys and Girls Club and others have really done the work to really create an infrastructure and to hear that these cuts are happening not only just cuts the program but it also really puts a, a really big dent in the infrastructure that these organizations have have really invested in and built and in in a way that that's also problematic because it takes time and years to make those things happen and to make those create those things and then to kind of cut and make reductions you know we may know we may not get back to where we need to be to execute and support our kids um, in our communities we already know that there was large youth unemployment rates and some of the youth unemployment rates are because our kids have not had sound strong um, career readiness they've not been connected to essential skills development and this is what we do this is what youth development programs do and ultimately it helps these kids connect to jobs that are also sustainable in the in the workplace uh, we were already looking at how do we create and connect more kids to stem stem employment opportunities how can we connect them to more opportunities that are actually providing more than a living wage and building everything we need to do to get them there and this is just a huge setback although we know it comes at a time that is you know unprecedented in any shape or any way shape or form we still have to realize that the investments that we're making now and continue to make are going to help us to build young young people and employ employees that are going to be able to help us respond to these issues our goal is to let's think innovatively let's not let's not eliminate totally let's think about what we can do to build the competencies that are necessary for the to 21st century workplace and how do we support the broader syp infrastructure ecosystem to be able to make that happen of course your words are exactly what is needed to convince anybody who's not that this program is important it's only really a 124 million dollar program last summer and in fact when we have um budget cuts this is not the, the millions to be cut and i know you talked about uh, experience work experience being gained skills building career pathways um i know that other speakers will echo that and they may also talk about some of the socio-emotional um uh, issues that we've all been in isolation we've all been anxious we've all been fearful We've all been unstable. Uh, many of us are feeling food insecurity. And I know the young people definitely are feeling all of that because we can barely get people fed in our work every single day in the borough president's office. We've been focused and focused and focused. Um, young people are feeling that even more. So Sandino Sanchez was raised on the Upper West Side. That makes me happy, of course. Um, he has participated in many, many advocacy efforts including the campaign for summer jobs in the early years and he's currently the director for workforce development for the children's aid society serving 3,000 young people every single summer and he was a payroll specialist and a teen educator 
for SYEP 35 years ago. That's why I love Sandino. So Sandino Sanchez, we listen to you very carefully. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Board President uh, Gil Brewer. So, to me, a uh, person that has probably, and many others in the panel have seen the trajectory of some jobs, where it came from, where it has come in the last 12 years of work to make SYP what it is right now. I think that we would all agree that this is not the time to cut SYP or stop any potential wages or income going to our families. We know that this is a time where where SYP should be part of the stimulus package because it's gonna put money and resources and support the families as we know because we see it every day. Families need food, families need clothes, families eventually are gonna need uh, uh, support with housing, eviction, job loss, you know, we have to invest in the future, which is young people. And it starts usually with SYP because SYP does something systematically. It removes all the employment barriers of our young people in our communities. It is $120 million that really realistically goes back into small businesses, goes back into the fiber of our community, goes back into the families that we serve, so that if there is a stimulus package, then this is one of those. And, and then instead of taking and removing resources from families, we should make sure that they get more than that. For Children's Aid Society, we've been at this game for over 160 years, probably in every transitional part of the social services community throughout historically. This is a time where we have to come together as providers, community people, churches, everybody to make sure that our families have everything that they need because we know that that makes a difference. These young people, we've already been preparing since January to do remote work with young people. We've been already preparing and organizing to do virtual STEM, virtual uh, academic enrichment, all those things we already have been planning to do. And when we received notice that SYP was cut, it kind of put us back backward because now we have to, now we no longer have to just worry about the things that I just mentioned. Now we have to worry about young people congregating together, hanging out, unsupervised, because eventually, let's be honest, families eventually have to transition back into the workplace, whether it's May, June, July, or August. So where are these young people going to be? They have to be around caring adults, guiding them and nurturing. The SYP of 2020 could be the bereavement specialist, the family support, the housing advocates, the, the people who know where the food is to make sure the young people and their families are fed. So again, this is really not the time to talk about what to take away from our families. This is a time to get together and think about creative ways to make sure that our families get the most they possibly, the most they can get, and more importantly, everything that they need because together we will survive this. Thank you. Earlier, as I didn't know about the fact that they can work on helping people to get food, which seems to be a challenge. Yes. Uh, also, we also looked at models where young people could do tutoring. The, the, the virtual learning at home is not working for everybody. These young people still need tutors. We could train young people to be virtual teachers and tutors online. If, you know, again, if the Department of Education was able to pull off a uh, 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 remote learning in a week, we could do something to the same or even better in three months. Okay. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Wayne Ho, who's president and CEO of the Chinese American Planning Council. It's the largest Asian American social services agency in the United States. And he, it's a 55 year old organization. It works with low income New Yorkers every single day. Um, it has launched the Advancing Our Community uh, and Community. It's a, addressing persistent needs and trends. Before being at the Chinese American Planning Council, he was Chief Strategy and Program Officer for the Federation of Protestant Welfare Agencies, which is how many of us got to know him. He was also Executive Director of the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families, and he's been on many boards and advisory boards. He got his bachelor's at UC Berkeley and a master's from the Kennedy School at um, Harvard. The other issue is, some of you may not know, but there was a large fire in Chinatown. And to the credit of uh, Wayne Ho and to the uh, museum, which is in the community, a lot of support has come to both the Chinese American Planning Council and to MOCA, which is the Museum of Chinese Americans. And he has been an amazing leader for that unfortunate situation. And also, 
he has been working hard to build a new headquarters for the senior centers and for the other programs in Chinatown. So he's both doing social service, SYEP, and more challenging real estate. That's probably the hardest of all. But anyway, Wayne, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank you for the invitation, Madam Borough President. So uh, I just want to give an overview of how the SYEP budget cuts impacts three uh, in three ways. First is to human services organizations. Secondly is to the staff of these organizations. And third, of course, is the young people that we all care about and are serving. Um, first, in terms of organizations, CPC, we have five SYEP contracts uh, across three boroughs. And by having this budget cut done in 24 hours, we're talking about a $1 million budget cut. And during this time when all of us are struggling to survive, we need to make sure that we are tapping into the federal stimulus package. So one of the main ones, which everyone I'm sure knows about is the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, unfortunately, because the city decided to unilaterally cut SYEP in 24 hours, that means we are forced to lay off our employees who are funded by SYEP. If we lay off employees, automatically the PPP goes from a grant to a loan that will have an interest on it. So the value of a federal stimulus package that many of us partner with the city of New York to fight for actually has less value now to us as nonprofit organizations because of what was done unilaterally on SYEP. Secondly, in terms of staff, uh, CPC employs 12 full-time staff through SYEP and pays for portions of 24 other staff through SYEP because we run such a large program uh, across, once again, all the boroughs. So these are staff that are in 24 hours, their lives, their families' lives during a time when there's a pandemic and there's not job opportunities out there and others are struggling, the city's budget cut in 24 hours, once again, impacts the livelihood of 36 individuals who are trying to support their families, their kids and others through this pandemic. And these are also staff who not only deliver on youth programming for CPC, they're the ones who are the first to volunteer in different areas from all the census outreach that we have to be doing right now to support our communities, to volunteering at special activities. When we go up to Albany or to City Hall during our state and city advocacy days, these are the staff that we lean on in order to make sure that CPC and the Asian American communities and our neighborhoods are supported. Last but not least, in terms of young people, and uh, I want to echo uh, what Dominique and Sandino already said, these are young people. We have about 2,300 young people that we support through SYEP. These are 2,300 young people of the 75,000 who right away will not be getting money, which means that once again, their families won't be getting the money that they need in order to recover from this pandemic. And $124 million is a small price to pay to make sure that our most vulnerable communities can be uplifted as we get out of this pandemic. It's also hard for me to see announcements coming from City Hall that says we're spending $170 million on a food program, when for those of us who do senior programs knows that the whole meal distribution program has been highly problematic with DIFTA or we're doing $10 million to have a PR campaign to tell people to wear face masks, but we're not devoting $124 million to support our young people and their families during this time. So I look forward to this conversation and figuring out how we can get on the same page of doing alternative summer programming and how we can all work together with providers, the young people themselves, and the city council to restore the funding for SYP during this time. We at CPC have been mobilizing. We're doing virtual town halls. We have young people who've been posting about this. We have our staff that are going out and getting interviewed. So I encourage everybody else to do that and let's all work together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wayne. Our next amazing speaker is Eddie Silvero who is currently the division director of Alianza um, at the Archdiocese, which we also uh, call Catholic Charities. He has previously been the director of Alianza Dominicanos, which he will talk to you about in terms of his work in East Harlem. But he was, at 19, he became the youngest co-director of the city's first Beacon Community Center, which was called La Plaza. He helped to design it, develop it, and implement it. 
and it served originally 250 young people. That was many years ago. So he has been doing this work for a great many years. Um, I would also say that he has received uh, many, many awards. Um, he has, he's modest. He doesn't always talk about his accomplishments. So that's why we have to do that. He has talked, he can tell you stories of all the young people he's mentored and what they have achieved. And there are thousands of them. So I'm really honored because he continues to innovate. He has spearheaded so many quality youth programs and services. Um, he's been able to uh, expand the programs that Alianza Dominicanas has and transferred over them to the Catholic Charities. Uh, and he has a wonderful space that often we use in Washington Heights. So um, 25 years later or more, I don't want to count them because then I'll start counting myself. I want to <laughs> to, to Eddie Favero. And he's also a great friend of our Deputy Borough President, Alvin Bonilla. Go so ahead. I just want to thank you, Gail, and to the panel. I think everyone has said almost everything that I want to say, but I want to, I want to start and say, we got to ring the alarm. We got to ring the alarm. We have to organize our young people because we are in the state that we're in. We're, we're you know, we're, we basically they have our hands tied, right? We can't go to city hall. We can't go confront the council members. We got to do everything virtually. We got to do it. I think all of us have been in enough Zoom meetings in the last two weeks. The truth is, we got to get young people to call 311. So every single young person that put in an application. This from now, from um, up to March 13, whoever put up an ap application should call 311, should, should let them know. So when the mayor sees and gets his report that he gets daily and says, oh, these young people, this is something we have to pay attention to. Same thing has to happen with day camps. I know that we're on SYP call, but everything is correlated, right? The truth is, let me paint you a picture, right, Gail? So what's going to happen? Well, our beaches are closed, our clinics are closed, our parks are being reinforced where they can't have people more than a uh, 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 gathering. So what's gonna happen? Our young people are gonna be on the block. And what's gonna happen on the block? The only source of that they're gonna have that they could control is gonna be a high, a hydrant. They're gonna take that hydrant, they're gonna open up. They're gonna call police officers. Police officers are gonna come. They're gonna engage young people. Young people are gonna engage police officers. The first two are gonna be, okay, okay, turn it off, turn it off. Don't, but we won't come back. But what happens when the tensions get rise, right? Last year we had two incidents where police officers were wept by young people and that became a big thing in our city. So imagine if you do this in every neighborhood, because we're just not talking about Washington Heights, we're not just talking about East Harlem, we're just talking about Harlem, we're not talking about Chinatown or, or Bushwick, we're talking about the whole city. So we have to, and I understand that the mayor has to make cuts, but not us. The truth is that you rely on us, so when the community, when there's a fire in the neighborhood, when anything is happening in our city, you turn to nonprofits. You turn to young people. So we need to make sure that SYP stays on the table. The truth is that, like Sandino said, everybody has said in the panel, 95% of the money that young people make stays in their neighborhood. And that's what's going to support the small businesses that, that are, are closed right now, that are shut. This is what's going to support the Patelito lady on the corner. This is what's going to support the bodega. We need these resources to come back into our city so we can able to bounce back from this pandemic. So we have been doing wellness calls, and I can tell you, we've done 3,000 wellness calls a week. And every top three things that come up is, where's my job? Where's the day camp? What is gonna happen? And I think that we are the ones that people are calling. So the, the mayor in the city has to take to account that SYP, it has to be part of the priority to, to make the city bounce back, financially, culturally, socially. The reality is our young people are nervous. I mean. I call young people. We have our own young people calling one another. And when we don't call them, they, they're like, what happened? No one called me today. So we have to make sure that we are prepared. And I, and I, and I think it's, it's just unfair that the mayor, the first thing he wants to do is to cut off young people. And I do know that we have to make these serious cuts. But we have to understand that the solution to our problems is not, is not cutting up our future workforce. Because these young people, we prepare them for everything from phone calls, medical, law offices, everything they could do. I think that there's, there's a, 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 an array of things that we could do. If you're gonna have the schools closed down, then we should create play streets. And then we create what the social distance looks like. If you're gonna have the parks open, let us run the parks. Let our staff, like we're not gonna have Beacons run day camp, have the Beacon staff run the local park 
or the local garden and made sure that there's social distance and that there are activities for young people. But you just can't say we're going to shut down young people. How are you bringing parents back to work? Where are these parents going to leave these children? So you got to, you can't just cut everything and say, oh, we'll, we'll figure it out. No, you got to hold us account and make us part of the decision making. Because the nonprofit is, you're going to call us when Washington Heights is burning. You're going to call us when Harlem is burning. You're not, this is not going to be resolved by one entity. This is going to be resolved as a community. And we have to come together. I think that a lot of us that are on this panel understand that. And we're talking about it. We're trying to figure out what is the best plan to provide to us, to DYCD. Yes, I believe we could do virtual work. I believe we could so, support our small businesses. Maybe we could have young people promoting the small businesses in the, in the day. Also, maybe supporting some of these restaurants that have lost that, right? The other thing is an alarm that I'm concerned about, and I don't know about the other colleagues. I have real good young people that are in college that were working with me now who are concerned, and they want to jump ship and go to other jobs, like the U.S. Postal Services and FedEx, who are hiring now because of, of the high thing of, of deliveries. And we're going to lose quality staff because they just need to maintain their rent. They need to maintain the support that they give their families. So we got to look at that because you're, you're weakening a workforce that strengthens this city. And I really want us to ring the alarm because it's not a simple thing that these are young people that are working. We have young people since the age of 14 that have been lucky enough to be picked by the lottery and have worked through their high school career and have come to college. And when they graduate college, we hire them to be training monitors. So this, it's a pipeline of youth workforce that, that, we, that we, we want to eliminate, and that should not happen. Thank you very much. I mean, I think another reason which I wouldn't have thought about, I teach at Hunter College, and, and, you know, virtual, obviously, and this morning with 20 students, you ask them, so what's next? They're all graduating. And the issue is very, very clear that they have fears that you and I might not have. And it's because who knows what the future holds? So it's more important than ever to not give those fears to the young people whom you're talking about, because it's, it's uh, something that could be transferred and we don't want that. We want them to know that we care about them. So um, Athena Moore is gonna ask questions uh, in a minute from our office, but I just want, I wanted Dominique also to jump in uh, again and just talk, you heard some of the ideas about partnerships and engaging young people, uh, virtual learning, figuring out how to use young people, use the space outdoors, uh, young people, and I just didn't know if you had also some other ideas in that you've been a subcontractor about what young people could do during the summer, because I'm a little tired of some people in New York City saying, I don't know what they're going to do. I know you all have the best possible ideas. So Dominique, I was wondering if you could jump in. I mean, I think some of the ideas, I, you know, some of the ideas that have been presented have been fantastic, and they're along the same lines that our organization is thinking about. I kind of go back to thinking about some of the revised strategies that DYCD had actually put out for us to begin to think about. So project-based learning and helping kids understand the, their community and how they can be impactful to the community. This is the right time right now to begin to think about how we can deploy that strategy for all the young people that could participate in SYEP. No, that's, that's the kind of thinking that I think we have to look at. There's, there's already been an investment. How do we not let that investment go. The other piece is their SYP programs, we've moved to a school-based model, we've moved to a NYCHA-based model, and those are where those are where the um where we our kids are needed most in support of the needs of those particular communities. Why would we begin to scale that back if we know that um, our residents in New York City Housing Authority, particularly our seniors there, are going to need support. Um, that our schools, where a school-based program, how could we leverage being in a school to help prevent summer learning, the learning loss that we know is experienced, leveraging SYP to do that. So I think that there's a lot of opportunity, and I think we have to just go to kind of the foundation and the innovation that has actually happened. That's a great idea. I know that uh, Debbie Rose, who's one of my friends and a council member, Staten Island, we serve together and she is not able to join us because the city council is having their very first in history virtual meeting. But Isaac Cortez is her legislative and budget director. Isaac, do you want to add anything to what we've been uh, hearing here? 
Uh, thank you, Madam Borough President. Hello, everyone. Um, excuse me one second. I'm sorry. I have a four-year-old in the background. <laughs> Um, so, no, I just, you know, we want to echo everything that the providers um, have been saying so far. Um, you know, we understand that this year's budget will include, you know, it has already included painful cuts. Um, and we just know that right now, um, at the same time, we need to protect the well-being of the most, you know, vulnerable population. And that, you know, that is our children. Um, you know, the council member, her first job was with SYEP. My first job was with SYEP. Um, and for a, a lot of us, a lot of the kids in the, you know, the city, this is their way of getting money, getting extra money, especially right now, where a lot of their parents are, you know, they're laid off and there's not any income coming into the house. So um, I think that the suspension was a devastating blow to not just the youth in the city, because I know that a lot of them were looking forward to this financial mm -hmm. assistance, I know, you know, or just a break, especially, you know, with them being in the house all day. Um, and also it was a devastating blow to the providers. The, the, we were shocked to see that they were given, you know, just 24 hours to cease all operations. The council member did write a letter to the mayor just urging him um, to also at least push back that, um, that deadline. We were not to say happy to see that, you know, the, the providers were given the extension, um, but it, it was good to know that they were at least listening to the providers and listening to us. Um, Right now, we are looking at proposals. We are taking in um, all of the ideas that are being given to us right now, and we're really just reviewing what our, um, you know, what our next best steps are to preserve, um, you know, some 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 sort of program for the youth for this summer. I think that um, to leave these children sitting idle during the summer is dangerous um, and the implications that it's going to have on the city, um, it's, it's, it's not going to, um, it's going to last for years to come. You know, we're not going to see the end of this just, you know, once the summer is over. Thank you very much. And I neglected to point out that Council Member Rose is chair of the Youth Committee and um, does a great job. So I now turn it over to Athena Moore. I just want to give you one example. We received emails from uh, Solar One. Solar One is an environmental organization, and we're all talking about the Green New Deal, the environment. There are so many ways where young people could participate social distancing themselves in gardening, in community gardens, in solar building, and getting skills that would definitely lead to jobs. So this is just one more example, I think, of places where this is a perfect example of what a summer could look like and contributing. So Athena Moore, please ask questions because I can't on my computer. <laughs> okay, I'm meeting my entire one. Thank you, Madam Borough President and all the panels. Question that I have is from Janet S. Are there plans to have DYCD fund remote working through the summer? Sandino, why don't you start with that one? I don't know the answer, but maybe you'd have some ideas about what it should be. Well, so I don't have the answer, but I know that before the budget cuts, we were, we were, it was hinted that we should build capacity along and utilize social media, uh, social, uh, so, social uh, virtual platforms. To, to build out at least the PBLs or what we call the project-based learning. So that was the original plan, but that was before the budget cuts. But we are still in planning to create as much opportunities for young people as possible to kind of do that virtual work that we all have become experts in the last two weeks. JT, do you want to answer it also? Because I know you've been working a lot on the policy. Right, so at, at this point, uh, the the budget cut means that there are not plans to, to fund remote work. Um, so 
a lot of the work that we're doing is to advocate for the budget to uh, to have those funds restored um, so that we so that we could see that virtual work happen. I think uh, what we've heard from providers primarily is that while there are a myriad of ways that we could uh, do virtual programming, including um, including cre credentialing for industry recognized credentials, career exposure courses, leveraging curriculum from other programs, um, virtual internships and virtual placements. I saw some people drop call centers and other virtual uh, jobs that, that could be uh, used. The other piece is that there, there are, like, like we've heard, there are safe, socially distant ways for in-person engagement as well. And so what we want to do is find a medium uh, a medium ground that allows for a little bit of both because ultimately there's not going to be a one-size-fits-all solution in, in what is an unprecedented emergency. Wayne, do you want to try to answer it? <laughs> you certainly have your finger on the pulse. Yeah, I mean, there, the, by all the budget cuts that was just done in the executive budget, there are no plans for summer programs. Uh, I think on the surface, uh, if I was a bureaucrat in the administration trying to find budget or money to save, I would say, hey, no summer programs. The problem, obviously, is they haven't thought through what does that mean for the staff, uh, who once again are human services workers, are essential workers. They've been deemed essential by the city and state, but we haven't gotten hazard pay. We don't have up pay to keep doing their work, and they're risking their own health and their family's health to serve the most vulnerable. Uh, but we need to continue advocating because we have plenty of ideas. The settlement houses got together with UNH, and we have plenty of ideas as does Catholic Charities, Children's Aid, and others. And I think there's ways that we can support our community members, keep people employed uh, while meeting their learning needs, social emotional needs, and other needs, and get exposed to different industries during this time. Okay. Athena, are there other questions? Okay. Yes, there are. So the next question is, what do parents need to do now to stop the mayors to chop off SYEP? This is from uh, Ko Fung is the name. All right. Dominique, you want to give a stab at that? I mean, I think that they need to be contacting their council member right now. They need to be sending them emails, barrages of phone calls to just say that this is unacceptable. I think that, you know, when we can, we need to figure out virtual ways to rally like this call right now. I see you have over 300 people who are really interested in this issue. So let's make sure that we are mobilizing all 300 people on this call to do all the things to make sure that our, our elected officials know. I think um, when, um, whoever said that about the stimulus, you know, there'll probably be another stimulus bill. There'll probably be more federal resources. We need to make sure that they're advocating for that. I know that there's an advocacy for more dollars to the state and to the cities. Um, in the next stimulus bill, we need to really make our voices known that a lot of those dollars are going to restore these types of employment. And this is really a wedge to um, generate um, economic vitality. But I think it starts with this, these types of conversations and getting people active and engaged with their local council member and their state representatives. Eddie, I know you could add to that. I mean, certainly if you're talking about advocacy, $124 million goes right back to the bodegas and to the small businesses. And then at the same time, if you're gonna to have to involve NYPD, which I hate the idea of, that's gonna end up costing you more. And it's so clear, but what maybe you'll have, you'll have better answers than I do. I think, you know, we have to also look at Congress, right? We have to reach out to our Congress members and have a real conversation with them because they have to push in the stimulus package. And, you know, and our congressman, my con uh, Adelis Bayar says that he was an SYP participant. That was his first job. That should be his calling to save SYP at the federal level. So, you know, I gather some of us have that responsibility to speak to him. I, I will be at an event with him tomorrow and I'll make sure that that conversation happens. But I think we have to include every level of government because the truth is, we also have to be clear that the governor sees this as a, part of his stimulus package because he's already cut a, cut a deal with the president. We don't know where his thoughts are with SYP. So we have to make sure that we advocate at every level of government. And I think it's all of us responsible and disabled. We are close to 10,000 young people that we're responsible for. Those young people should get a call today and say, hey, we need you to make these calls and get those numbers to them, right? We have to, but I think Congress, we have to involve our congressmen, we have to involve the gov make sure the governor's looped in. And of course the city council and the assembly members um, but I think put the pressure to those, and also to 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 
local people that have been SYP participants that benefit from it and that are professionals now, they should advocate at that level as well. I always liked my bill, but no adult liked it in the city council that said that 16 year olds should be able to vote in city elections. So maybe if we had that, we might have a different story right now. Uh, Athena, go ahead. Yes, what changes will be made to the other DYCD programs such as Work, Learn, and Grow program where SYP participation is required? Who wants to take that on? Whoever runs them? I don't know, Wayne, do you run them or somebody? I mean, I cut. I'm sorry. I, I, I think everything that's school based, SYP, Work, Learn, and Grow, they're, they're, they were eliminated. I think that one goes with the other, so they were all eliminated. Actually, okay. um, the, the council hasn't received any details about work, learn, grow yet. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Athena. Yes, this is for Sandino. Sandino, in addition to tutoring, what other kinds of remote work internship opportunities have you been imagining? Um, CAW would love to keep our partnership strong. This is Daniel Bergman. Yes, yes. So we, 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 have been, we have been building capacity about creating what we call the next outreach workers virtually, training them in a mental health CPR, doing wellness checks, tutoring. Uh, the gardening piece is excellent because you could, you could have one person per garden and you'll comply with whatever social distance, distancing is on board. So we also talked about data entry. We talked about uh, executive shadowing, remote shadowing you know, uh, following uh, a professional virtually as, as they participate in the Zoom, a young person could kind of be a fly on the wall. So we kind of looked at everything. We talked, we also looked at STEM, STEM uh, robotics virtually, you know, se sending people, sending the young people the kit via mail and then having them do the robotics online. So again, we, we looked at several platforms and we were confident that we, we would be able to pull something off had we had the funding. Does anybody else want to add to that? Ideas about building capacity and things that could be done that were different, but really, really uh, informative for people's learning abilities. Okay. All right, next one, Athena. Yes, this is from Clayton Banks. What happens to the SYP funding? Some of that has been addressed. The rationale in the announcement for the suspension was social distance. Okay. Some of you know Clayton Banks, so he's head of Silicon Harlem and very involved with um, trying to get more uh, devices and obviously free Wi-Fi into Harlem. It's very, very challenging, but he's been working on it and certainly making some strides. So that's maybe a little bit why this question is coming from where it is. I don't know who wants to take a uh, stab at it. I mean, the, the city is facing tough economic times and they're trying to claw back as much money as possible. Uh, we saw that in the executive budget that came out. We've seen that in some of the other budget cuts that's happened. Uh, we saw that with yesterday's email that we got about city council discretionary funding, that it's only guaranteed through March 22nd, and we need to determine what's essential through the end of this fiscal year. So it seems like the city is trying to pull back any money. I wouldn't say that they've said that the $124 million from SYP is now going towards X program. Um, but what we know is that the city, um, because of what happened with the state budget, the city's looking at city tax levy dollars. And most city tax levies goes to libraries, arts and culturals, children and youth programs, senior services. And those are the areas that are most fungible for the city. Unfortunately, those are also the programs that help our communities and low income and underserved communities try to succeed during this time. I think also by doing these budget cuts, the city's actually leaving money on the table. Uh, the state did put in more money for SYEP, and now are we going to be able to draw that money down because we won't have an SYEP? So uh, it seems like they're throwing out the baby with the bathwater in this budget cut. Right, that's, that's the issue. Over the years, always OMB, we always used to say, even for supportive housing, right? We have $15 million from the state, but the city will say, well, that we have to put in 15. Yes, you do. But we would say that you're leaving money on the table, and this is the same, uh, same discussion. I don't know if anybody else wants to jump in because this is a very important topic. Um, JT, do you want to talk about this? Yeah, I, I think um, 
the the fact of the matter is that the the original frame was regarding a public health angle and, and concerns about social distancing but i think that as wayne said the executive budget that we saw last week had cuts for all summer programming across the board um and i i, I think it does call the question uh i i don't think that the the funding isn't just sitting there right it's being pulled back and 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 moved around. But the interesting thing specifically about that state 22.6 million is, I mean, those are TANF funds and they're earmarked for subsidized wages for low income families, specifically families that are that are receiving public assistance. So especially that money, that money, when we're talking about an economic stimulus, to leave that money on the on the table is unconscionable. So um, we've been working uh, a lot of our, our partners up in Albany, uh, we got, I think it was 50 assembly members and senators to sign on to a letter uh, requesting that the mayor work with OTADA, the Office of Temporary and Disability Assistance up at the state level, to develop a plan to get that money to those families ASAP, because we know um, from surveys that we've done, the, there are many low-income families in New York that rely on SYP income to stay afloat over the summer in regular times. And those families live in communities that have already seen disparate impact from COVID-19 and, um, and to, to balance the budget on their backs is, is, really, is really a disgrace. So uh, Dominique, I know you've worked in city government and uh, as I have for a long time. And the issue of course is always this matching dollars and what you do with it. Do you also agree that it needs to get off the table and be part of whatever we can figure out? And what are some ideas that could match the 22? million um, that's obviously uh, allocated for exactly the population we're talking about. I mean, yeah, of course. I mean, the whole budget exercise is a dance every year anyway. We shouldn't be dancing right now. So we should be really clear about what our priorities are and be able to identify those dollars. There are creative ways to think about all the different types of revenue that come into our city, um, whether they be, you know, yes, we're going to lose city tax levy because we're not collecting taxes right now. That's right. But we should also be thinking about what are some of the other resources that can be deployed in support of of these of these needs you know i'm not i'm not as detailed as jt is on the, the nuances of government funding at this moment but i will say that there's a if there's a will there's a way and you know and i also think that you know the the state budget although we know it's going to be challenging it is encouraging that they continue to still invest in after school. They continue to invest in other kind of youth and employment programs. We know that there may be changes as the economic outlook looks different, but there's still this kind of, we're gonna, we're gonna try to move forward with our priorities because we know that this is what is necessary to recover. I also think that we have to think creatively about you know, these ideas about food distribution, these ideas about kind of organize, all of those things are coming with lots of dollars attached, not just government dollars, private dollars. And so how are we deploying young people in those spaces to be able to support and execute um, and those what we know are going to be critical needs well into, you know, not just six months, not just 18 months, a year, you know, 24 months from now, we're still going to be really helping communities recover. And I think that those are ways that we could begin to think about bringing much needed resources into um, to support young people and their employment. Okay, thank you so much, Dominique. I'd like to turn the next question uh, over to you all. It says, in addition to saving SYP, which is 100% essential, with other summer programs closed this summer, for everyone not winning the lottery, what else can we do to ensure life-changing and saving opportunities for employment and work-based learning this summer? Could the city possibly require companies to offer virtual internships as a condition for any types of contracts, tax benefits, et cetera, or any other way to make sure our young people aren't completely deserted this summer? So I know you all started talking about this. You may want to go a little deeper. This is from Lindsay Dixon. Again, I think that that is a fantastic example of when well, wise minds get together that's the type of think process that communities should be engaged. The answers and the solutions of the decisions are being made from the top and they're coming down. But there's tons of ways the, the person asking that question presented yet another opportunity that will help develop 
our communities, especially those that most need it, which is young people, giving them yet another opportunity. So I think, yes, I think that we have not been, we have not been allowed to think this critically and to give those recommendations to those that are making decisions so that in their decision-making process, they can incorporate and have those options out to corporations that again, are gonna, at one point or another, these corporations will want to bounce back up from the hole that they're in. Thank you for that. Anyone else want to take that briefly? And I think, yeah, as Sandino said, I think, but you need the nonprofits to do that, to help that, right? So if you're gonna engage uh, the corporations to do that, you need us so we can manage the young people, right? We're the ones that have to register. Because what people forget that the most pivotal time for SYP is now. Between April and June, this is when we're registering young people. This is when we're collecting documents. This is when we're doing orientations. We were gonna all do virtual orientations, right? 10 hours of virtual mm -hmm. orientation was on the deck for us to do it this summer. So all of that is the process has to happen now. We need to have these answers now. I mean, they were smart, right? They went from April 8th, we were canceling the contract. You have to April 15th, they say, oh no, now we're suspending it, right? Because they themselves realize if we are able to bring this back for different reasons that JT's mentioned, maybe we could do a smaller scale, but let us know with time because it's unfair to young people and it's unfair as a workforce because people are making decisions of if they're gonna stay in this field or they're gonna go work to, so they can ensure that they can pay their rent. So yeah, that's a great idea, but you do need nonprofits to support that work and that idea. And I, I just wanna build on, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. I wanna build on that point though. I, I think this is really important. First of all, Lindsay, I wanna say that I don't think anybody here wants to accept those uh, summer camp cuts either. I think that we are currently working right now to pull together a campaign a little embarrassing to say i sound very millennial but hashtag save our summer nyc um right. we want that campaign to happen so that we can talk not just about syp which is essential as you know but all of these programs are essential how can people get back to work if the economy starts to open up if there is no child care how can families rely on camps for for-profit camps or or camps that are, are doing fee-for-service that are able to subsidize some of those costs for lower income families with SYEP interns, all of these things are interconnected and we have to talk about them in one fell swoop else we get divided and conquered. Um, I think the, the biggest point is right now we're super concerned about that timetable because if we followed the standard budget process, what would happen is there would now be negotiations and with Council Member Rose and Council Member Johnson, Speaker Johnson, all working to fight for these programs, we're in a much better position than we were but the problem is that the timetable on that is going to be really, really challenging because what's going to happen is the eventually the mayor and, and the speaker will get up on city hall steps and maybe not actually shake hands, but handshake. And at that point, program providers are going to have to turn around in two weeks and put together a totally new kind of program uh, from, from scratch. It doesn't make any sense. And so we're pushing for, for announcements to come out sooner than later so that we have the appropriate lead time to put together programs that, that are gonna be impactful and, and are gonna help the, the communities in the way that we're all describing. Thank you so much. I'd like to open the next question and you feel free to uh, circle back to anything that you still wanna address. But this has to do with uh, voting and young people and mobilizing them. It says uh, many SYEP participants are too young to vote. Is there a way we could mobilize uh, their voting parents? And um, a similar question was mentioned about just how we vo mobilize them um, in general. Well, I, I think, yes, I think one of the things, I mean, Gail said that we wish that voting rights were 16 and over, There's, this will be a game changer. But the truth is that we have a group of 18 year olds that are, that are SYP participants, 18 to 21, and we should target them. We all could go back to our thing and do the age, and send them an email regarding that and that that right there we can see what that voting block looks like but i think yes we have to engage parents so part of the wellness calls that we do to our parents we do speak to the parents so from younger you've told the youth so so i did yes i think the idea is to really uh put a target and figure out how do we exercise that these parents call the elected officials and and I, again i would say call 311 but that's one of the venues that the mayor looks at how many calls goes in so maybe we can show that put SYEP on top of that map and put day camps on top of that map. So we have to figure it out, but yes, we have to get our 
our, our, our parents involved and our 18 and over involved and to exercise their, their rights as voters. I mean, we know that uh, many administrations, including the mayor and the governor's administration, get moved by media. So the moment we heard about these cuts, CPC, we already mobilizing our youth alums, our parents, uh, caregivers, staff. A lot of our staff used to be SYEP participants, and we hired them on to be our great youth staff. Uh, but I think all of us just need to be uh, in this echo chamber right now. Call the council, call city hall, to call the mayor's office. All this information is public, and just email them, get on online. I don't believe I'm pushing for Twitter, but go online and it's time for us to just make some noise about this because we are running out of time. We do need to bring the young people back and we do need summer programs back as soon as possible. Yeah, thank you. I know we have a few more questions um, and we're getting close to the end, but I just want to acknowledge a few more. Um, Jamila Nicholas um, asked about applications that have been submitted. Um, how will they be managed if change comes? And Al Kirkland from the PA Al um, asked about remote programs for training peer tutors and counselors. Um, so I want to take both of those uh, comments, if you will. So the first is related to applications being managed. So the as soon as our contracts were suspended, DYCD uh, cut us off the what's called the YEP system which is our data collection, payroll management. So right now, no provider has access to any of the applications. I guess one, once they cut the program, they also cut us from that important data that Eddie was talking about earlier. As far as remote training is concerned, we, in, before, we received, before we received news that our deck camps were affected, we already had started training our, our potential counselors for the summer in, in uh, uh, you know, confidentiality, uh, CPR mental health, and those things that we've already been trying to kind of be ahead of the curve when it comes to training because we couldn't have meetings more than four or five people. Thank you. Hey, hey, hey Al, I think you're right. I think Al, I think you know, hit it. If we don't have the day camp or the cornerstone or beacon um, staff or compass staff, we can't do the remote training, but the truth is, yeah, that would be an excellent to, you know, to create a, a tutor academy virtually where we could um, get group leaders and tutors trained during the summer. Then hopefully when schools resume in September, that's a workforce that we could hire. That's a great idea, but right now our hands are tied. So I think that, and then Sandino said, you know, that we don't have access. Those of us that had constant contact accounts with our young people, we're, we're lucky. So we still have those numbers and we could reach out to them. But they did freeze us from from having that data that 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 San Diego mentioned yep online. Okay, thank you. And I know the borough president is back with us. I just wanted to um, acknowledge that other questions that are in the chat. We know how many jobs and how much funding the mayor has said he plans to cut. Has anyone moved to estimate and project quantitatively and qualitatively, short term and long term, the human and financial impact of not providing these? essential opportunities for our children to learn, grow, and contribute. Joe Rogers submitted that. Issa uh, or anyone, would you like to take that on um, in terms of any estimates out there about the cost, um, the impact of not providing these essential opportunities? Uh, take off of your mute. I'm sorry, I, I can't speak right now. Just go it's to the fine. next panel. I'll revisit. If anyone else, I know the borough president is a big supporter of data um, coming from the independent budget office, which we haven't seen yet, but that's one important source. Um, Gail, I don't know if you want to mention anything related to that. Uh, you're on mute. Unmute yourself. I be open to do that analysis because the 124 goes into the neighborhood. What would it be without that? And what would be the cost of the alternatives? And the other thing I want to mention is the business community in terms of our advocacy, because whether it's the bids, the chambers, or the partnership, that community also relies on the young people for all kinds of support. Now, the mayor did indicate, oh, the stores are going to be closed 
not correct. Many people are open, they need that support, and these are the communities that need the support more than anything. The hospitals need support. People who are leaving the hospital need support. So there's a lot of uh, places, not just virtual, that young people would be tremendously uh, welcomed, uh, particularly during the summer. So I, I can't imagine, I think that your advocacy is going to work. That's just my belief in how things happen, whether we will get the entire 124 plus beacons plus cornerstone plus day camps, I don't know. But we will end up, thanks to the leadership of the council member, the speaker, and all of you getting what I think will be a, a summer with young people employed in a way that makes sense for their future and for your nonprofits. Because the not, people forget the nonprofit sector really is the backbone of New York City. And so I, I say that because I think it's, our time is running out. But what's not running out is your enthusiasm, your intelligence, your commitment, your knowledge. Um, the city can't survive without your direction and without the young people who you are so supportive of. So I'm here to say um, we will keep fighting. I do think the idea of highlighting the congressmen, people on this call who have been SYP um, in terms of their past is an excellent idea. We're always putting the city college graduates and the Baruch College and all of that. Well, you're the alums of SYPP are our best advocates in many ways. And that's something that maybe that $10 million could go towards that or some portion of it. Because that's an ideal that I think uh, maybe we could get somebody to do pro bono. I'm here to say thank you. Yeah. Uh -huh. to add anything to this amazing discussion um, from presenters who have the knowledge and the wherewithal to really run the program in a way that could be better than ever because we're under such stress to make sure that the emotional opportunities are there for young people, not to mention the employment. And I think this summer, more than ever, this program is needed for all the reasons that we know only too well. So thank you, JT. Thank you, Dominic. Thank you, Sandino, Wayne. And thank you very much, Eddie, for all of the work that you've done. And I don't know if it's seen if you want to add anything. Yeah, just, just lastly, that um, the last thing that people have been asking about while we can't get to everything is about the federal dollars, the corporate funding, and any of the SBA loans that could be redirected uh, towards this effort. So if anybody would want to answer that in our closing. Athena? Um... I don't know if I can answer that particular one, but I just want to mention that um, it's important not only to keep in mind the economic rationales, the economic rationale that gave birth to SYP in terms of all the economic benefits, but I think it's also important because we're discussing a lot about public health. And if there was a public health rationale for social distancing, people also have to understand there was a public health rationale for the origins and the creation of SYP and other youth development opportunities to mitigate uh, risk behaviors and other type of behaviors that young people without given structure and without given opportunities, without given resources, could then uh, 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 create their own uh, alternatives. And that's one thing that uh, SYP and the youth development uh, rubric of youth development a fabric of New York City in particular that's so well developed by nonprofits was meant to prevent. So, so I think it's important that the question would become, would public health professionals be in favor of, of reducing or limiting or eliminating youth summer opportunities or would they be against that? And then try to figure out a way to ensure that youth uh, uh, opportunities can be uh, uh, attuned and aligned with social distancing and other public health uh, realities of COVID, but to make sure that the origins of SYP in terms of economic and public health benefits is kept in mind as we fight and argue for the presence of this program. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Alden Bonilla, because he didn't introduce himself, but he is the Deputy President. Go ahead, Athena. Yes, just, just that um, the, the other final um, comments, I know our community board members, Barry Weinstein was one of the ones that asked about the funding issues and the fashion studio is also on and they have um, expressed that they want to assist uh, with advocating on behalf of SYP or the out of school time program. And finally, that the fresh air 
fund is represented, uh, Tara Gardner is on, and she wants to ask about how organizations that do not traditionally operate SYP um, organizations um, could be involved in exploring opportunities to partner uh, around these issues. I think the first thing is to make sure we get the funding to make the program and then we could know, because a lot of people have asked also um, what employers would expect in relation to basic knowledge and workforce skills that the employers want to know in advance. But first we have to make sure we have the program and that's what our goal is. So I know all of us are going to be mobilizing. Um, I think the idea of having the congressmen and others who are graduates part of some kind of a campaign is also an excellent idea. And I think that the business community as well as community absolutely affected every day uh, need to be part of that. So we'll do our bit by working, asking the independent budget office to do the analysis that Athena talked about. And we will also, because I do think the economic, as Alvin Bonillo stated, the economic arguments are as strong as the arguments that young people need to have this for all the reasons that you have cited. So there are so many arguments to keep SYEP and all of its tangential operations in place this summer 2020. And that's why we're here. And we hope that um, everyone will understand that the many, many hundreds of people on the call and then all the work that needs to get done. I don't want to conclude without saying, don't forget to fill out the census. Um, I have yes. To you, the numbers are not great. I'm a, a nerd for the map. Every night before I go to sleep, I look at the map. And it's not what it should be. Alvin Bonilla, who's the expert more than anybody else I know on this topic, maybe you want to add to that, Alvin. Um, this would be another job for young people, getting people to fill out the census. Because we have more time to be able to do it, even though we don't want people to take that time. Young people working with to fill out the census, what a great idea. And there are many more just like that. Alvin, do you want to add anything about the census? No, you, you, you just dropped the mic. <laughs> you just dropped the mic, it's right on point. Okay, all right. Uh, uh, Ina, do you want to add anything or does anybody else want to do closing? Just closing to any of our presenters, if any last word, if not, then we're thankful and looking forward to our continued work together. It's really quickly, I think that we know in every disaster that the government has to be the lead. From 9-11 to Sandy to 2008, the government has to be the lead, but they need to want to have philanthropy, nonprofits, and businesses at the table. And I think the unfortunate thing is we as the nonprofit sector want to partner with the city, but we've seen too many missteps in the last five, six weeks. Um, yeah. We don't understand why they're not inviting us to the table. So let's get to the table and let's figure it out for youth. Let's figure out for seniors. Let's figure out for meals, et cetera, et cetera. So let's all work together. Dominique, go ahead. Dominique, you want to say something? Okay. Any closing no. comments? I think Wayne okay. said it all. Everybody said it all. I don't want to be, you know, you dropped the mic, Gail. So we're good. Let's mm -hmm. keep, let's keep working for young people. All right. Thank you all very, very much. This has been a phenomenal discussion. Much more work to be done. Have a great evening and let's let's hope. Good night, everyone. Thank ring you. the alarm. Ring the alarm. Yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you guys. You. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.